Hey church, I hope you're doing well. So just a word of warning, right here at the beginning, I want to talk about something that's a little bit, little bit controversial. This isn't, you know, one of those no touchy kind of issues. This isn't a, a you need to start sweating and, and wringing your hands and getting worried about what's coming. No big major thing right here, but it, it causes some people to, to flare up a little bit and to disagree. Here is the topic right at the start, NBA basketball. Now I know some of you might uh, hear that and go, what? Who cares? It's NBA basketball. Well, that's, that's no controversy. I could, I could care less. And I know there's, there's some of you that respond that way. Others of you, though, I've run across people with this opinion. When NBA, NBA basketball is mentioned, there are folks that go, NBA basketball? That's not even basketball. All they do is carry the ball, and they're a big bunch of, of wimps, and they just complain all of the time, and they're overpaid, and, and blah, 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 blah. That's not even basketball. How can you bring up something like that? See? That's where the controversy comes in. Because on the other side of that argument, there are people who are absolutely fanatics about the sport and the NBA. You know, getting the car uh, in their favorite team's color, doing the tattoos, uh, hair wig, face paint, all of the stuff. Crazy about the NBA and the competition that is found there and their favorite athletes and their favorite teams and on and on and on. NBA basketball little bit of a controversial subject. Who knew? For me, eh, I, I enjoy it to a certain extent. I don't watch all season long, but but at this time of year, it's, it's the playoffs. And there's some teams that I like a little better than some other teams. And so I'll watch some games and I'll, I'll get involved. My life doesn't revolve around it. it. It doesn't really revolve around being a fan of any sport for that matter. But But I do enjoy the occasional game. And this has gotten me to think, as I've watched them recently, it's gotten me to ask the question, what does it take to be an NBA player? What do you need to make it to the league and to play in the league? Even if you're one of those guys riding the bench, what does it take to get there? And this is what I came up with. This is my uninformed not really an expert by any stretch of the imagination. This is the list that I came up with, with what I think it takes to be an NBA basketball player. And if you happen to be one, or you know one, or you can ask one, see, you see if any of these things are right. But this is what I think it takes. First, I think it takes a uh, ridiculous amount of athletic ability. I, I mean, that's just sort of the prerequisite. You gotta be a skilled, athlete to play in the NBA. I mean, have you watched these folks? They can dribble the ball through their legs, around their back, all that stuff, stop on a dime, jump 500 feet in the air, do a backflip, ball behind their head, and slam it down on your face before you even blink and, and understand what's happening. They, it's like a prerequisite to be there. You, you need an insane amount of athletic ability to make it to the league, to play basketball on that level. That's number one. Number two, I'm pretty sure you need to be like uh, an outstanding, freakish almost, human specimen. I'm fairly tall in most contexts. I'm just shy of 6'2". At the NBA level, I'm short, very short. Not only are these guys athletically gifted, but they are physically gifted as well. These are some tall, tall men. Uh, of course, there are exceptions, but... By and large, these are some, some big dudes moving around and doing ridiculous things. And so that's my number two prerequisite, my number two requirement. You gotta be, you know, peak physical condition, athletic, and also your build needs to be a certain type to, to make it there. The third thing I think you need is hard work. I, I mean, there, there are some that can maybe skate by on their, their talent and their ability, but, but mostly these people are dedicating a lot of their life to that game, practicing their dribbles, practicing their moves, practicing their shots, 
thousands and thousands and thousands of balls, day after day after day. Uh, extreme hard work and dedication. That's the third thing. The fourth thing, and, and then we'll be done. The, the fourth thing that I think, though, that you, you need to make it there is to catch some kind of break. At some point, some door has to open somewhere for you to get there. And, and it probably needs to open when you're fairly young, that you would get into a program that you would learn the skills needed and get the exposure needed so that you can be along the right path to get there. At some point, you need some kind of a break, a, a door to open, somebody to let you in and to point you in the direction that you might wind up. Those are just some of the things that I, I've thought that you need to have if you wish to play basketball on that level. Now, most of us, I would probably say all of us, but most of us won't ever play there. Uh, it's just not in the realm of possibilities. We're, we're, we're not equipped in that way. But I, I wanted us for, for us to think about, you know, that top level NBA athlete before we ask the question then, well, what does it take just to play basketball? If, if, we're, if we're not talking about NBA level, what, what's required to play the game of basketball? Some of you might say, well, what's required of me is a set of new knees and to move the clock back a few years. And, and I'm sorry. You know, if, if, that's, if that's the case, I, I'm sorry uh, that I'm bringing this kind of stuff up. But, but let's get even more basic than that. Outside of, you know, physical skills and physical limitations, what is it that you need to play the game of basketball? Here's what I've come up with for that. First, you, you need a ball, right? You, you need some type of ball in order to play the game of basketball. It's in the name. Also included in the name is that term basket. You need a hoop of some sort, a, a thing through which you will shoot said ball. So you need, you need a ball and you need a basket. And, and then you need some type of court, some type of plain area. You need some boundaries defined in order to play the game of basketball. You also need uh, a decent agreement between you and whoever else you're playing with on, on some understanding of rules, what the competition looks like, what the scoring looks like, all of these things. You need an understanding of the rules of the game. And then last, I think you need uh, uh, other people. You, you need to play with other folks. The game of basketball requires more than one person. So, so those are the things that I think you need. A ball, it can be, you know, a brand new Wilson ball like they, they use now in the NBA. It can be the older Spalding version. It, it can be some kind of duct tape together, uh, flat thing, or maybe even, you know, like a crumpled up piece of paper, but you need a ball of some sort. Then you need a hoop, the thing that you're shooting it into, the thing you're shooting it through, whether it's the fancy ones they got in the NBA or, or just, you know, some remnant of a laundry basket that you're using uh, in your backyard. You need a hoop. You need a court. You, you need defined boundaries. If you're playing, you know, on the, on the shiny hardwood, that works. If you're playing on the dirt and gravel, that works. If you're playing in your office, that works. You just need to have an understanding of, of where you're playing the game and where you're not playing the game. The rules. You need to know the rules. It can be NBA kind of rules and, and follow what they follow or high school or college or, or whatever. Or you can play like a game where it's no blood, no foul. And if it's your granddad that happens to foul you with his watch and does draw blood, that's still no foul. You just need to know the rules of the game before you proceed. And then you need others. If you're just practicing, if you're just shooting or just dribbling, you're not really playing basketball. You're building up your skills. So that's what you need. That's what you need to play the game of basketball. Now, what does all of this have to do with us? You need, I mean, I'm obviously not like some basketball podcast here or some uh, basketball channel. So, so we, we talk about things on a little different 
plane a little different focus. We're hopefully zeroing in on the things of God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit will hopefully come up in conversation. We're, we're hopefully talking about the things of Christ. So what does all of this mean for us with that being our focus, with the things of God being at the forefront of what we're talking about? I hope that you remember that you're someone who is given a mission and a purpose as a follower of Jesus Christ. That there is a, a competition almost, a, a game to play, a, a mission to fulfill. It's something that we've talked about different times. There's, there's something to be done for you as a follower of Christ. And if you're not yet a follower of Christ, there, there's something for you to be done too. It just looks a little differently at this point. But there's something for you to be done. And, and I want to ask the question, what are the requirements for that? What are the requirements to participate in that game? What does that look like? What do we need to have in order to be an active follower of Jesus, to, to play the game of basketball in light of our relationship with God? You see, we're in this season now where we're in between Easter and we haven't yet gotten to, to Pentecost. And we spent the first part of that season doing some time celebrating. And, and that's, that's great. That's wonderful. I'm glad we did that. But that doesn't take away from the fact that we still have this mission, this calling, this thing that we're to do. In fact, it was during this time between Christ's resurrection and, and Pentecost where the Holy Spirit was given that Jesus gave the commission the great commission the mission to his followers go and make disciples of all nations teach them all that I have taught you baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and so we know that mission is hanging out there and I'm asking the question today well what do we need for it what do we need to accomplish what God wants to accomplish in us and through us and with our lives well, if we look in the Gospel of Luke, we hear this other bit that happens in this time, this Easter tide time that we're in right now, this season that we're in. And this is something that Jesus shares with his followers before he ascends. Uh, this is before Pentecost, and this is like a final teaching before he ascends to be with the Father. And this is what he says. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. That's Luke chapter 24, verse 49. I'm going to send you what the Father has promised, but, but right now I want you to stay in the city. Stay and, and wait until you have been clothed with power from on high. You know, that's, that's an interesting thing to me because I would think that the disciples at least in my eyes, it would be like the NBA level kind of guys. I mean, they had done the stuff. They were in the boat when Jesus calmed the storm. They experienced that happening of Christ. They were in the boat when Jesus was walking on the water. Peter, who would have been one of the people hearing this message, he walked on water himself. When Jesus fed the 5,000 with the loaves and the fish, they were included in that. They ate that bread. They tasted that fish. When they sat around the table for communion, the Last Supper, Jesus in his physical self gave them the loaf, gave them the cup. He, he was, these guys, they were part of what he did. The water into the wine, they drank that wine. Lazarus, when he was raised from the, from the dead, they probably gave him a hug and a high five. The lepers whose spots were, were taken away, they, they were there to witness that healing. If anybody was qualified to speak on what Jesus did, these guys were it. That they, they matched all of that description that you would need to be an NBA star, at least in terms of Christian life. They had followed after Jesus. They had given their lives unto God. They had witnessed uh, all of the things that Jesus did. They were there uh, when when He was crucified. They they got they were there when He was when He reappeared when after He was resurrected and and ate fish with them. They were 
in the right spot and had everything that you would possibly think that they could need. A, a wide variety of skill and talent and firsthand witness to the power of God. I mean, this was elite level stuff. And yet Jesus said, you guys, you're not ready yet. You're not ready for the game yet. You're not ready to enter into the competition. You're not ready to fulfill the mission yet. You need something else. It's almost like Jesus said, you want, you want to play basketball, but you don't have a ball. You have nothing to shoot. And you really don't even have a hoop or a court or other people to play with or an understanding of the rules. You are lacking. You need something else. And what is it that they needed? They needed to be clothed with power from on high. They needed to wait until the Father and the Son poured out the Spirit upon them before they could go and carry out the mission before they could go and compete in the game. The disciples needed to wait before they entered into the arena and fulfilled what Jesus had asked them to fulfill. Now I understand for us, we come on the other side uh, of Pentecost. That, that's something that's already happened and, and for believers in Christ, we're given the spirit when we believe in Jesus, when we give God our heart and we recognize that Jesus is Lord, God puts a, his spirit within us. And so Pentecost has already happened. And so we're at a little different time than the disciples. But I think that this lesson here still applies. We too also need to wait and go. We need both aspects, both parts are crucial to being able to participate in the game. We need to wait on the Lord and be clothed with the power of the Holy Spirit before we think that we can go and accomplish anything for God or for God's kingdom. Wait and go are both re required. Now, now, for some of us, we hear that word wait and we think, yes, that's my excuse to never do anything. Uh, would you like to participate in this mission? No, just waiting on the Lord. Uh, would you like to, to tithe uh, to your church? No, no, just waiting on the Lord. Uh, would you like to be a part of this Bible study? I'm, I'm waiting on the, on the Lord. There's, there's a tendency for some of us to hear that thing to wait and think, yeah, that gets me off the hook. Or there's some of us on the other extreme that think, I just go, go, go. I work for the Lord, I work for the Lord, I work for the Lord, and there's, there's no waiting. But what we really need is both. We need to wait and go. We need to have this attitude, this posture before the Lord that we recognize, God, the, the most uh, crucial ingredient to this working for me to fulfill a mission or for me to, to play a role in the body of Christ, the, the most important thing that I need is to wait on your spirit. That, that I wait upon the Lord. And that waiting can be hard. It can be challenging. We, we don't often like to wait for things. And yet that's the very thing that we're, we often are, are asked to do. God will give us an idea or an insight and, and we may want to jump right into it, but, but our attitude needs to be, Lord, we want to step when you want us to step. We want to wait on you because we know that we need you to accomplish, to compete, to do that which you've asked us to do. Waiting is critical, is important. And then also stepping out in faith and taking action is as well. To, to respond to the things of God and when God tells us to go, that we go. When we, he tells us to stay, we will stay. Step out on the water, whatever that is, that we're sensitive to the Spirit, willing to wait for the power that, that comes from on high and willing to step out when that has been received and we've, we've give, been given the direction on what we're to do. Friends, don't, in your life, be discouraged by others that you view as like NBA level players. I mean, there might be people who are more gifted at certain things uh, within the body of Christ, 
but we each have our role, we each have our duty, we each have our thing that we're called and asked to fulfill. Don't, don't focus on what somebody else has been given and allow that to detract from what you have received. Instead, know that, that to accomplish any ministry, to accomplish any purpose within the kingdom of God, it requires more than you have by yourself. More than your talents, your gifts, your abilities, all of those things. It requires so much more than yourself. In fact, it requires the very power of God, the pouring out of the Spirit. And so I encourage you to ad adopt that mindset, that you're willing to wait, to ask uh, the Spirit of God to, to fill you and to use you and to, to guide you and to direct you. And then when you're, you're centered in the Lord, that you're also willing to go as well and to put into action and to participate with the things of God according to God's will and God's kingdom. Wait and go. Wait and go. That's what we need if we hope to participate in this game of life, this grand uh, thing that God has put into motion and that God continues to work within, waiting and going by the power of the Spirit, for the glory of the Son, and giving honor and praise to the Father. Will you do that today? Amen.